Egypt just reached 100 million uh, the day before or yesterday or the day before. Uh, we were timing uh, the, the birth that will complete the 100 million within the boundaries of Egypt. So we're so lucky to talk now. It's one of those, uh, you know, points in time. Um, population in Egypt is young. Uh, we haven't aged yet. Uh, the per proportion of older population is 6% of the total population. So it's not that big. 6%, which means 6 million. But let's talk about those 6 million, how they live. Uh, the first thing that we can think of, those are people who are uh, you know, went into retirement, uh, they are crossing the boundaries of their working age, uh, they have finished their tasks in life, their children are growing up, so we have to talk about those, how, those people, how they are living. Um, in order to talk about that, Egypt culturally is a family-oriented uh, country, so everything falls on the family. Family is taking care of the children, family takes care of the adults, family takes care of all the adults. Uh, family is the basic or the most important institution in caring for the individual within, within Egypt. So this means that the family is taking care of those older persons. How they take care of those older persons, what kind of changes that happened in the life of the older person and the people who's living around him is very important. Um, if we're talking about aging studies within the context of the Egyptian society, we'll find that uh, there is a major contribution on the side of the medical uh, society. Uh, why? Because it's accessible for them. Older persons, usually have uh, some, you know, co uh, need for service, medical service. They, ha they visit the doctors, they have the, the records, they have the history of the records, quote unquote, because I have a problem with that. Uh, so they are accessible, they can investigate them. But on the other side, we can't find that much of investigation about the social life of the older persons in Egypt. Uh, social life means that we're talking about the family, their history in the family, their contribution to the family, their burden on the family, whatever it is. There are so many dimensions that we have to talk about it. If we're talking about mental health, it comes from the family. If we talk about psychological well-being, it's family. If we're talking about well-being of the older persons, it comes from the family. There is another side, which is family that uh, take care of that person. It's very important to, to talk about the caregiver. We don't have any research about that. Only very sporadic that happens in a few studies. One of them that we had in Ismailia, it was about 17 years ago. The data was extensive, but it was on a very small community in rural Somalia and urban Somalia. It's not sufficient. We're looking for a huge effort in which we register the regional differences, the, the cultural differences within the so Egyptian society. We need to study that. The connection even between the how the uh, situation evolved from the social side to the medical side is lacking. On the medical side, yes, uh, when I need a service, I go to the doctor. The health system in Egypt, as all the countries in the world, has a private sector and governmental sector and uh, there is an NGO. Yes, I can go to a private sector, but he's going to collect information for the whatever symptoms that I'm suffering from. But he doesn't have the whole history. He doesn't know where I'm coming from. And it's very important to understand the root causes of what I'm suffering from and how this suffering is going to translate on the family. So this idea can say, we can say that, in, that we need a comprehensive study, not only medical, 
not only social, but we need a connection between the two of them and everything. And for the social, we're talking about well-being. We're talking about intergenerational uh, relationship. We're talking about isolation. We're talking about uh, changes in living condition. We're talking about uh, uh, even for those people who are not co-residing with their family, they are they are living alone, how they are living alone in their facilities, how the community are contributing to their well-being, how the uh, surrounding network is contributing to the well-being, what kind of... This can help the policymaker to put policies, interventions to support those people. There is no study that I have ever heard talking about the caregiver. Uh, the caregiver, as you mentioned, they usually the daughter. She is the basic support. Even if there is no daughter, the sons will substitute, but it wouldn't be as perfect as having a daughter. So the daughter is in, in the, the Egyptian culture. Let me come back, you know, go back a little bit to say that uh, the Egyptian culture is uh, similar to the all Middle Eastern countries in which the children never leaves home until they get married. So we're talking about uh, a person who's responsible for their children from age zero until they reach to age 30 or 35 or whatever until the last child comes out of the house. So she's responsible for the family uh, from the birth of the, her child until he leaves for marriage. And actually, let me talk about after marriage what happened. They usually come back with their children, so it's just never end. At the same time, she has the mother or the mother-in-law in which she's taking care of her. And she has her work if she's a working woman, and she has her own house that she has to take care of it. So she, the sandwich family is really suffering in the context of Egypt. We need to address those people. We need to understand how those people are managing their life. Uh, okay, it might be like ups and down when the children leaves home and the mother is still in a good health. So the woman is taking a slight break, but the, there is a point in which the mother or the mother-in-law starts deteriorating in her health. We don't know that. We don't know where is this point of time. We need to understand those caregiver needs to be um, taught or uh, uh, increase their capacities or skills to identify where is the tipping point, how to deal with, with these, uh, with juggling all these uh, duties that she has to do. Um, Caregiving is in older population, we end up saying, okay, I'm taking care of my mother, uh, this is my obligation, but where is, what are the different transitions that this older person go through? For me, I'd, I'm taking care of my mother, but I have no idea where, it, what are the different stages and what the future is going to look like. I'm taking it one day at a time, but this is not the way of doing with it. I'm a professional woman, so I need to know that at one point of time, I have to stop working because she needs me. She's not accepting help from other people. And even for the, you know, service care, caregivers that uh, for hire, we don't have that concept in Egypt. So we need to understand, okay, either to introduce this concept or move away from that and, uh, you know, well-equipped the caregiver, the familiar caregiver with all the tools and understanding and the, uh, you know, the material that help them to cope with the different stages of aging. It's very, very important. And we need to understand how stressful is this because those are, um, they're going to age. With that stress on them, eventually it's their life in, in old age is going to be more stressful than their mothers and we're going to go into a vicious cycle. We need to understand that. So we need to study those people and their burden and how to make, how, what kind of intervention that can we make to make their life easier. The question of caregiver is not only about knowing their situation now, because we need to follow up what happened with the caregiving. 
uh, it evolves with the aging, with different stages of aging. So we need to understand where we stop, where we change our behavior. Uh, my mother or whoever I'm taking care of, uh, the person is changing, but I'm still considering her the strong woman or the strong man who has been strong forever, but something happening. You get frustrated, the, per the person gets frustrated, and everybody is not knowing what to do. We need information, we need skills, we need, uh, even for the well-educated person, we search on the net, but it's not formulated for our culture. We need intervention, we need information that fits with our culture, with our people. How are we dealing with those people who were strong in, the, in our life? They are the reference that we come to, and eventually they are thinking that we're the reference. We cannot take this role with them. It's, it's totally uncomprehensive for, for a person to understand that his father is looking for him as a leader. No, you're the leader, I'm, I'm the son, I'm the daughter. So we need this for, for educated, uneducated, everybody needs this. Everybody needs to understand. We don't want uh, our older per, per, uh, population to end up isolated. They are living in an island and we're living in another island. We need to work together. We need to understand what they need. We need to let them feel that they are welcome. They are not burdened. Uh, sometimes I see older persons in other countries working, active, participating. But in our society, older persons confine themselves to their homes, to their rooms, to whatever it is. This is not good. This is not a healthy aging. We're looking for a person who has, at the end of his life, feeling active, can work, can do something, can volunteer. They, can, they have so much experience, but they need to be reached at, in the proper time, in the proper uh, mood, in the way that connect them with the generations. We talked about Egypt and we said that, okay, uh, Egypt is a young population, but uh, believe it or not, um, uh, Egypt is going to be aging so fast. Uh, somebody was saying that uh, by 2100 to 23% of the population will be aged, which is a huge number. Uh, so we need to work with that. We need to address that. It's, it's not going to take us a long time, just like Europe, in which policies were developed slowly by trial and they have now matured in population aging and their policy. No, we have to act now because, okay, 6 million is not a huge number, it's not a priority, but eventually, at one point of time, we'll find ourselves that we really cannot cope with the problem. So we have to start from now. Also, Egypt is going into the what they call a demographic dividends. We have a huge population in the middle age. We have to actively engage them. If we can start by now by engaging them in caring for the elder persons, by the time they age, they'll find somebody else who's going to take care of them. We have the, uh, the experience and the capacity and the, uh, what you call it, um, adapted way of taking care of the elder person that is based on our experience, our culture, how to work with the, our older persons, not how to work with the older persons in uh, Europe or uh, United States. We need to know how to deal with our older persons. We have large and huge difference between our older persons across the world. We, but everybody has his own specificity, his own culture. We need to come back to our tradition and how to respect and work with our elderly in a way that makes them happy and also their family happy and everybody surrounding them is living well and we're promoting well-being for everybody. We talked about uh, residence and we said that uh, family takes care of, the, of their elderly and most likely they reside with their children. However, um, 
as a professional woman and educated woman, I'm thinking that when I get old, I'm thinking of living alone. Why should I live with my child and in his house or in my house? The idea of living alone would call for technology. It's very important that I would have access to technology that fits my needs and my children's needs and will keep the communication between the two of us connected all the time. So, and you know, yes, I admire the fact that we're now using technology in everything in our professional life, uh, using it in our social life, but there must be a way to facilitate this technology and make it accommodating for the older persons. Um, okay, with age, uh, hearing class is very common, so we have to work with the uh, with the voice, somehow the voice of the whatever technology that we're using accommodating this hearing loss. And color contrast, uh, there is so many design on the phones that fits with the younger population but doesn't fit with the older population, the font size. So we need to create something that's uh, you know, like a module within each phone that you that is being produced to facilitate the use of these technology for the older generation. Um, yes, I can deal with it now, but maybe in the future it's going to be something so sophisticated, but I'll refer back to my older, older phone because it's, I have been knowing how to deal with it by experience. But if I find more technology in the future that can facilitate my love and ease the communication with other partners, um, with my friends, not my even my children, my friends. Uh, we're sitting at home, but we can communicate through this technology, which makes, okay, I'm living in my environment that I'm comfortable with. They are living in their environment, but we're communicating all the time, make, make life easier and uh, breaks the social isolation that we're talking about in old age.